All right. Hey, welcome to Discovery. Everyone welcome. who's joining us online, wherever you're at or outdoor, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today, you guys. Come on. Amen. We are in this series called Relationship Rehab. We're in the second installment, and I got the privilege today to be teaching with my honey, Pastor Veronica. We've titled the message today. Honey. Yes, you are. Stop. <laughs> you my honey. You titled the, the message today, Restoring Harmony. How do we restore the peace inside of our relationships and our marriage when it's been maybe filled with a lot of friction and a lot of conflict? And we know a lot about friction and conflict because we've been married going on now 23 years. Rhonda. Right, right. Yeah, how yeah, amazing. This year, I think anyone, after the first year of marriage, you understand a lot about conflict, yeah. right? Amen? No? Everyone had a great first year? Wonderful. Not for us. Just wait. But anyway, we were married at 19. So we were married super young. And we've definitely seen statistically how that doesn't normally work. And so by God's grace, great mentors, amazing therapy, yeah. that we've seen a marriage that's not perfect, but we're really proud of it. Yeah. So here's what we've been praying over your life and over your marriage. And by the way, if you're not married today, the principles that we're going to be sharing with you through God's word can apply and do apply to any relationship that is in conflict, that is in friction or turmoil today. The same word can apply to those relationships. So we've been praying for your life and for your marriage. This verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. And I speak joy back into your home and into your life in Jesus' name. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind, live in peace. And I speak that right now over every marriage that you would have full restoration. In Jesus' name, that you would live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. How many of you sound good right there for your life, for your marriage? Any of that sound good? We all want peace. We all want this. But, but it's not often what we're experiencing in the reality of our homes. We may want peace, but the reality oftentimes is we get a lot of conflict. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that Jason and I have repeatedly learned over the years is how to deal with conflict and the different forms that it comes in. And conflict really just means those differing opinions and strong emotions running together. So we're not always the same. We don't always think the same as our friends, our spouses. We have different likes, different thoughts, different opinions. And then you mix a little bit of emotion in that, and that creates a little bit of conflict. But conflict in itself isn't bad. Now, for the um, women out here, we understand that conflict during a certain time of the month can be a little worse than others, amen, yeah. right? And so let me give you a little advice to the husbands in the room. A little advice to the husbands in the room. When it's that time of the month, don't take anything serious, okay? First of all, don't take anything serious and it. agree with everything. Agree with everything, <laughs> everything. Especially if it's not only that or if there's perimenopausal or menopause happening, agree with everything. It's going to be a long time, but it's okay. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Now, I would say if, you're, if your wife or your spouse isn't menopausal or past that stage, you should get a period tracker. I'm dead serious. I feel serious. the Holy Spirit moving are, in this place right now. Your wife is still doing that. Wow, that was in that wisdom. Stage, it's wisdom. Y'all didn't I hope know there was a period tracker thing. Some of y'all need name. to hear heaven that today. That was Rayma. That was Rayma. Uh, you need to get one because then you know what to expect. And that alone, that's like, we, we're done with the message. Just, just you, let's leave now because. You need to you know when know, she's in the window. If you can just know, what, then the conflict is cut 50%. For sure. If you just know what's happening, you know, like, why she's saying things that she normally doesn't say or want to change everything in the house, you know, things like those type of things. But but truly, if you're in the room and you're like, man, we really do have conflict. You guys don't understand. You guys are pastors don't understand. We have conflict in our homes. Mm -hmm. Know that conflict is absolutely normal. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you can write down today is all, all relationships have conflict. Yep. Yeah. All relationships have conflict. And so look at your neighbor and say, I know you have conflict. I know you have conflict. I know you have know. conflict. Yeah, I know. I know. It's so crazy. We all have it. And then number two is great relationships, or the second thing you can write down, great relationships have healthy conflict. So I hope you all strive for great relationships. Now, if you're, um, now you can look at your neighbor, and now if they're your spouse or your child or a friend, look at your neighbor and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a part of having a healthy, great relationship. So hopefully I just solved all the conflict in all the marriages right now. 
Some of them never said those words. I just feel like they almost threw up in your mouth. Some of you like the whole room just got set free by apologizing. It was awesome. It was awesome. So here's here's what we want to do. Pastor Veronica and I developed this journey, this message for you that we believe is is really going to help your life, your marriage. Uh, We want to start off with sharing with you the four causes of conflict. Like if you're in conflict in any any relationship today, it's probably because of one of these four reasons that I'm going to share with you. And then we want to share with you the four responses, like how we respond to conflict. But ultimately, there's four decisions that you need to make today. And if you make them, I believe that you can restore the peace to your heart and to your home. Does that sound good? Amen, everybody? Okay, let's start right here, though, with the four causes of conflict. Take some notes with me. Number one is poor communication. Poor communication. This is so important because men and women communicate differently, don't we? In the middle of conflict, men want to hear language of respect from their wives or from, and and women want to hear language of love and care. We communicate very differently. For example, if the kids go to bed and they're, they're asleep, men and women want to hear something different in that moment, okay? A man wants to hear his wife in that moment say, honey, the kids are in bed asleep. I'll be in the room naked. That's what he wants to hear, okay? She, she different, man. She's like, well, she wants to hear. In that same moment, kids are in the bed. She wants to hear from her husband, honey. The kids are in the bed sleeping. I'll be in the room folding laundry. Right. Amen. <laughs> or vacuuming yes. or making the bed, doing some laundry. So there's a different way we think the species here. But not only that, I think in our culture, in our day and age, wouldn't you agree with me that it's become so vile, vulgar, and vicious the way that we can treat each other, the way that we can just tear each other down and we almost are very comfortable i think annihilating other people and the reason is i believe we dehumanize people very often so they're not people that need to be respected it's just a social media profile that's the reason why you can tear it down so much because it's not a person it's a profile and they're not a people group they're a political party So we can treat them this way. I was thinking about this, and I I was reminded um, of an incident that I had in traffic. And you can learn a lot about somebody in traffic. But I was was getting onto the on-ramp, onto the freeway. It was Ming in 99, packed. It was packed crazy. They had a lot of construction stuff they were doing. And I was, like, fighting my way to get into the freeway lane, and my on-ramp is ending. Anyone ever been in that situation where you're like, y'all jerks need to open up a space? Okay, and so no one, and I'm looking, I got my blinker on, I know you see me, but they're not looking at me. You know what I mean? They're just like driving forward like this. You, I know you see me here. Right, right. You're okay. either that person or you've been that person. Are you been that person? So, so I'm like, like, I need to get in. No more lane is, is happening. And then all of a sudden there's this passenger, a young girl. I think it's her mom driving, at least in my mind, it's her mom and the daughter. She turns to me and locks eyes. And at that moment, she saw my sympathy. <laughs> and she's and, and and she just sees it. She reacts to it, turns to her mom, and she taps her mom, and her mom <sighs> and does one of those things, and I'm like, thank you, thank you. And I get in. What happened here was was I locked eyes with this young girl, this young princess daughter of God is what she was, okay? <laughs> Child of God. I became because she saw me, I became a person and not a vehicle. I was not just, see, many of us, we're just, we're just so locked in and focused on our own journey, our own destination, and you see all these vehicles that are just obstructions and obstacles getting in your way, and they're not humans that deserve respect and value. Psalm 141, verse 3 says, set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Some of y'all need to memorize this verse. Put it on your... Your mirror, your yeah. bathroom, your, your phone. Your phone, yeah. get a screensaver, okay? Because you need to you need to set a guard over my mouth, oh Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Notice here that every response to conflict is not go immediately to that person and work it out. The first response to conflict is going to God. Oh Lord, I'm I'm upset. Help me out with this thing, because it's gonna get me in trouble. Put put a guard over my mouth, Lord. Amen. Amen. Some of us need that on our screensaver. But so the second cause of conflict is unfulfilled expectations, unfulfilled expectations. These are the shoulds that we have for people. I always say don't should on people. You know what I mean? 
don't do that. Don't shit on people. You should do this. You should be that for me. That's kind of messed up. You know what I mean? It's messed up. We shouldn't do that. You know, especially to our spouses or sometimes even as mothers, we do that. Like, my kids shit on me all the time. And I'm like, you know what? Stop that. I shouldn't get all, I shouldn't make every meal for you. I shouldn't do all your laundry. I shouldn't do all that. As soon as they can walk, they should do dishes, you know, like two or three. As soon as they can open the dishwasher, they should be able to fill it. But we do that to other people. We have these shoulds on them. We have these like expectations that they're not even meant to feel. James says, what causes quarrels and fights among you or fights and quarrels among you? What is it? So if I was to ask you, like, what is it that's causing some of your fights? You would probably insert a name here, maybe your spouse's. Or your kid, whatever. You would you would insert someone's name. You would insert people who are rude and, and mean or arrogant. Or maybe you even think the gossip people at work are the problem. They're the ones causing the fight. They're, or those people who like to gossip and talk bad about you. They're, they're, they're sabotaging your life. They're the ones that are the issue. But James says this. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire that battles within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. So the answer is what causes these fights? It's this unmet expectation. It's that you don't have something that you want. And you want it, and you are expecting it from your spouse or your kids or your parents or your friends or your coworkers, and really you need to be going to God with that. Yeah, and actually the very next verse of James says that. It says you do not have what you want because you do not ask God. And the reality is a lot of the friction and conflict is you are putting an expectation on people what God can only give you. So, so you're in, in some of you, you're putting so much pressure in the relationship that that person is supposed to complete you, is supposed to give you peace, supposed to give you your, your value. They could never, and were never, so you're putting an expectation on somebody that was never even meant to be on them. It was something we were supposed to go to God. So unfulfilled expectations is a cause of conflict. The third one is despising differences, despising differences. So Look, all of us are different, and, and it's the reason why we got together in the relationship in the first place, right? We noticed that they were different. It's why we noticed them. We, we, we say things like, I mean, you know, you complete me, and, and they were, it's what attracted us because we know, like, their strengths are not my strengths, and I'm attracted to that. Wow. They're just they, – and, and eventually, though, after a while, it no longer is, like, complimentary. It now irritates you. You're, like, you're irritated by the differences because right. not only are – our strengths different, but our weaknesses are different as well. Yeah. And you're hot, and she's cold. And you want to spend, and she wants to save. And, and so my wife and I handle situations differently. We have different personalities in some aspects. We have different love languages for sure, but that's a good thing. We need that kind of balance and support for each other. I mean, if I was married to me, I want to kill me, okay? So I'm glad I didn't marry a it. me, you said okay? It. I marry someone who's different mm-hmm. from me. That's what mm-hmm. I, I like. I enjoy that because it's better to be different. It's better. And we, mm-hmm. we understand this right. in some aspects of life, like in, like in sports. Super Bowl is later today. We understand this in football. It's better to be different. I don't need everybody on the team to weigh 300 pounds. You know, I just need four or five guys on the line. Those guys need to weigh. The, the dude in the backfield, I don't need, I need him skinny and fast. I, was, I don't need him weighing 300 pounds back there. He needs to be fast, okay? And then I need, my, I need one dude who's tall, can make good decisions with the ball, who has high intellect, okay? And we, so we know this. On a team, better is different. It makes us stronger. If everyone was the same, that would be a terrible team. But if you get to the place where your differences are now not valued, You don't respect, you don't value the difference. You start to despise it. You're in a very dangerous place. The enemy has trapped you. And I would even say in our nation right now, we're getting to a place and we have been going to a place where we're so divided, where, where we're so polarized in politics, where those differences, we knew they were always there, but now it's, it's, I believe this. And if you don't believe this, I hate you. And there's a, dis- there's a despise now of the difference. And I think Abraham Lincoln had it right, you guys. When Abraham Lincoln became president, he put people in his cabinet 
that ran against him in presidency. He put people on the other side of the aisle in his own cabinet because he didn't need to hear more of himself. He needed to hear more of others, more of the crowd. And this is, this is extremely important, you guys, this one here, because look what Mark chapter 3, verse 25 says. Jesus said, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. So whether that's the house of representatives or the Hannish house, I can never let the differences in our life become to a place where I devalue and despise the other person. So I actually appreciate my wife. I, I appreciate the way she sees things that I don't see. But once again, if I have conflict, I'm not trying to get her to fix stuff. I'm going to God, having him do something inside of me first. Right, Amen. Which leads to this last one, I think. Yeah, it does. And the only thing we cannot differ on is that we're, we're Eagles fans, right? Is that true? Yeah, we that? are Eagles. A house divided okay. against itself cannot stand. Yeah. So she had to get converted. I have to be an Eagles fan just when, she, so we're when we got married. Yeah. That was the only thing we could not differ on. She used on. to like the Buccaneers, but then we fixed yeah. that We fixed that thing yeah, real quick, you guys. I was delivered. I, I was said, a house delivered. divided against itself. You were pimp. He, he repent, delivered woman. me. He delivered me. But anyway. <laughs> All right. And then number four, write this down, is our sin nature. Yeah. Our sin nature. Now, a lot of us in the room, we love Jesus, and our spouses love Jesus, and our family loves Jesus. And so sometimes we find this, like, oh, this, this, this war of why do we have this conflict? Why, do we ha why don't we have this peace, and why do we have these quarrels and fights and things like that? Because we're, we're saved. We all love Jesus. And, and we, we wonder why we struggle with the sin nature. In Romans chapter 5, it says that through one man, Adam, and let me just point out Adam. They didn't say Eve, not me. I'm quoting the word of God. said through one man, Adam, sin entered the world. Okay, so we just catch that. Can I say that one more time to make sure everyone got that? Through Adam, not Eve. It says through Adam, one man, sin entered through the, in the world. And, and, and that was the original sin that separated us from God. That one man, Adam, separated us from God. His sin, the original sin. <laughs> Um, and then, <laughs> and then we see that through one man, Jesus, we have a reconciliation and grace now where we get to come back to God and we have this reconciliation and grace with God now be through Jesus. Now that is, that is salvation. So we, yes, we love Jesus, but when we love Jesus, there's still this sin nature that we deal with. There's these things that we can't just get past, those things that we're going to have to like work through and, 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 and allow God's grace over us. So we have these expectations in our marriage and in our families and for our children where we battle with that sin nature. Romans 3.23 says, for everyone has sin, we all fall short of God's glorious standards, meaning us. Those of us who love God, we have these standards that we ourselves are falling short of. So if I know that that scripture is for me, I also know that that scripture is for him. I also know that that scripture is for my coworkers. I also know that scripture is for my children. I need to have that same grace to understand that where I'm falling short, they will also fall short. They will also not be able to attain it. None of us in the room can obtain these standards. So what I tell myself constantly, not constantly because it's very rare, but Pastor Jason cannot always get it right. He is not going to always get it right, and I don't expect them to always get it right. I don't expect my kids to always get it right. Sometimes some of us are parents that when our kid makes, has an accident or, or does something wrong, we just, like, harp on them, and, and like, we, we punish them for accidents. We, please don't do that to your children. Yeah. Don't do that to your spouse. Don't do that to your family. We should have this measure of grace for each other, this measure of, of, of knowing that I know Jason isn't always going to get it right. Yeah, we, we leave room for it. So these are the causes of, of conflict in our, in our life. And if you're experiencing conflict right now, it's probably one of these reasons. But the reality is it's our reactions to the conflict that actually make it either healthy or toxic. Remember, we all have conflict. Everyone has conflict. But it's how you're responding or dealing with the conflict is going to determine if you actually are having a healthy relationship or if it becomes toxic and destructive. So let me show you the four ways that you can deal with the conflict. Now, the first several are the wrong way, but the reality is we do deal, some of us deal with conflict these ways that you can deal with. It. The first way is this, my way. Okay, when we have a conflict, it's my way. Why? Because I'm the boss. Because I said so. I'm the dad. I'm the, I'm the man. Submit. Well, that's why. Because yeah, I said wow. so. So, wow. or whatever it is. Some of you deal with conflict this way. That, that you, you are not, you're going to continue to have conflict until you get your way. 
okay? And so you are a my way kind of person. I'm going to win. I'm not going to lose. I'm going to win because I'm right my way. That's one way to deal with conflict. The other way to deal with it, kind of the opposite of that, is write it down your way. So some of you, maybe you live with someone or you have experienced the whole other person being my way, but maybe some of you thought the way that you're going to actually cause peace in your relationship is just give them what they want. Okay, your way. But that's not giving you peace, is it? There's no peace in your heart. You're actually just a miserable martyr when you do that. You're just like, okay, I'll just give you your way. Go, go ahead. No, that doesn't, that doesn't help and that doesn't heal. But it's one of the ways that we respond the wrong way to conflict. My way, your way. Another way is, I think a lot of you think this is the right way, and it's getting better, but it actually isn't the right way, which is halfway. Some of you think, well, I'll let you get your way 50% of the time, and I'll get my way the other half the time. And the problem with that is, she just wants to kill me half the time. Okay, maybe not here, but you know what I mean? You're just upset. You're mad 50% of the time. So this isn't the solution. So what is the solution? What's the way that we're to respond? And honestly, every time that I preach the Word of God and I come here on Sunday and I teach you the Word of God, you're going to see this contrast with the world's way. What is, what is the way? God's way. How do we deal with conflict? God's way. God has a way for us to deal with conflict. And here's what it is. You know what God's way is? Here's what God's way is. I let him deal with me first. That's God's way. Before, before I deal here with this and I try to fix her and fix this, I let God do something inside of me first. Oftentimes when I'm counseling couples, I'll tell them, hey, let's table this issue that we're arguing about and we don't see eye to eye. Let's table this for the next two weeks and let's just see how close we can get to God. And after two weeks, I'm telling you, nine times out of ten, it solves the issue or it puts them in the right posture to deal with the issue the right way. Because God actually wants to do something inside of you first, before he's doing it, in them or in the both of you. There's this popular verse, a popular saying, you probably heard it in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, where he says, there is a time for everything and a, present, a season for every activity. Some of you have heard that. But in verse 5, here's what it says. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. And some of you have maybe read that or heard that and you hear that right now. And you're like, what does that mean? Scatter the stones or gather them? What, here's what this means, this, this poetry from God's word. It means this. Every time that you're in conflict, you have a choice to make. You can choose to grab those stones and scatter them, meaning to throw them. You can choose, and some of you have been choosing. It's the reason, it's, it's why you're hurting today. It's why there's no harmony today or peace today. You're choosing to scatter stones. You're throwing stones at each other. So he says you can either scatter them or gather them and build an altar between you and God. These are the choices that you have to make. And there's, this, there's a beautiful story about, about this choice that we have to make with stone throwing or stone gathering in the old testament let me set it up for you in, in genesis chapter 28 and 29 you can go read that it's, it's a cool story when you get a chance a story of jacob where he's go, he goes into one of his relatives house laban he kind of flees to laban's house inside of laban's house he finds this beautiful daughter of, of his named rachel he falls in love with her immediately and he goes to laban and he asks him what can i do to have your daughter in marriage and he says work for me for seven years and I'll give you my daughter. So he does. And the Bible says that he does that. And it goes by so quickly because he loves her so much. But after seven years, they have this wedding celebration. Jacob goes into the tent. And, and Laban does not send Rachel into the tent with him. He sends his first daughter, Leah, into the tent. And he sleeps with her and doesn't recognize it until the next morning, which is a whole other whole message in and of itself. <laughs> but he wakes up and he's like, wait a second. You're not Rachel. So he goes to Laban upset, and he's like, you tricked me. And Laban says, oh, we got this custom. I'm sorry. I couldn't give you my second daughter. I got to give my first daughter first, Leah, in marriage. And he says, well, what do I got to do to get Rachel? That's the one I want. And he said, work for me for another seven years. So not only does he work for seven years and he does marry Rachel, but he continues to work for him for almost 20 plus years. And the relationship gets really toxic, okay, between Laban and Jacob. So much to the point where one day before Laban gets up really, really like early or late in night, he says to his wives, let's get out of here. We're leaving. I'm tired of this. We're not even going to say goodbye. I know I'm the manager of his estate and I have a lot of responsibilities, but we're getting out of here and I'm leaving. 
in him. So he sneaks out. And then Laban wakes up and he sees his manager, Jacob, who's running the home. You know, he's running the herds and stuff. He's not there. And he's ditched like with his kids. He doesn't even get to say bye to his kids. So he's offended and he's upset. So he saddles all of his men, his horses and his warriors, and he's going and chasing after Jacob now. And, and, and there's about to be a very like bad conflict, a toxic situation where both of them feel like they have a right to be offended and the other person is wrong. And Jacob hears here come, that Laban is coming after him. And so something has to happen inside of Jacob's heart here. A decision has to be made. Are they going to scatter the stones? Are we going to pick up these stones and, and clobber each other, thinking we have the right, you offended me, and I'm, I have a right to smack you with this thing, or are we going to build an altar? In Genesis chapter 31, starting at verse 45, it says, So Jacob took a stone. He could have he thrown it, but he built a pillar. He built an altar there. And he said to his relatives, Let's not scatter stones, Laban. Let's gather some stones. Let's make an altar to heal us. So they took stones and piled them in a heap, which, which means an altar. And they ate there at the heap. So I want to encourage you today, this whole message in one sentence. Before you ever try to resolve anything with the other person, first build an altar and let God do something inside of you. And what's beautiful about this, if you make this decision today to stop throwing stones, and gather them, build an altar, it, it's no longer dependent upon what the other person does. It doesn't affect your heart, okay? Now, this is why this is so important. Look into my eyes, you guys. Some of you have trapped yourself in the conflict you're in because you've told yourself it'll never be right until they blank. It'll never be right. They'll always be mad. and It'll never be okay until they. And what you have done is you've surrendered your peace your happiness to the situation and to the other person. And I want to give you a new thought. This big reveal of the message today is this. Write this down. Conflict cannot continue without my participation. I don't have to wait for you to decide. I already decided. Therefore, there is no conflict. You know, conflict, it takes two people to have a conflict. Now, it only takes one person to be bitter. It only takes one person to have a hissy fit. But it takes <laughs> two people to have a conflict. Okay? And, and, uh, and I've already, look, if I don't play... It's over. I'm letting yeah. God do a work inside of me. I'm letting God change me. Mm -hmm. And I know some of you are skeptical right now going, uh-uh, that's not going to work, Pastor. You don't know my situation. Yeah, but have you let God transform you into an, a brand new person? Okay, so here's, here's what I want you to do today. I want you to gather. Stop throwing the stones. Gather some stones. Build an altar just between you and God. And I want to give you four decisions to make. Four decisions to make that today will restore the harmony in your heart, the peace in your home. So don't even start working on your reconciliation between you and whoever. I'm starting with me. And I know that's not what some of you want to hear right now. Some of you are like, come on, pastor, help me. I drug him to church today so you can tell him this. You've been dragging him and drugging him for a long time. And it hasn't been working, has it? Okay, because you've been praying, God, change him. And God's been waiting for you to pray, Lord, change me. Uh, Lord, good. change change me so what do we do how do we restore the peace in our marriage i guarantee this works if you stop scattering the stones and you gather them and make an altar four decisions here's here, number one i will act and not react i will act and not react see just because you can explain why you acted the way you did does not excuse the behavior of what you did when, when what you said it doesn't ex so i will act and not react. So no longer am I waiting around for you or for this conflict to come. And then the nails come out in our relationship. No. And then I have to come to church again on a Sunday and go, oh, God, forgive me. I messed up again this week. No. I'm going to, I'm pre-deciding here. And it may sound odd to you, but every married couple ought to do it. You ought to have a pre-fight plan. A pre, not a pre-flight plan, you know. A pre-fight plan. Veronica and I have a plan, like when it happens, because it's going to happen. There's, there's some things we're going to do and not going to do. And it's actually, it's based out of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27. You guys know this verse. A lot of you do. In your anger. So you're angry. I understand. It's okay. But in your anger, do not sin. So there's a choice there in the middle of that. You have to act, not react. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. So, so in other words, the Bible is saying, don't go to bed on that. When you let it pass... 
You're giving the devil room in your marriage. You're giving the foothold of the enemy room in your life. So instead, here's what Veronica and I actually came up, and we've come up with these pre-fight rules. These aren't in your notes, but I want to give you some pre-fight rules today if you want to take some extra notes. Here are some pre-fight rules for you. Number one, never put it off. Never, never put it off. Don't go to bed on it. Don't sleep on it. This has actually motivated us to have some late night conversations. Man, we better figure this out because I'm tired. Okay? I want to go to bed. In fact, uh, our last argument that we were in, our last disagreement, I ain't going to tell you when it was, but in our last one, conflict, our last, last conflict, conflict we, I came to Very Veronica and I was like, honey, I said, you're my best friend. I, I love you. You love me. Let's, go, let's just cut it all off right now and let's be friendly to each other. Mm -hmm. and, and because it was so late, she was just like, Okay, let's go. <laughs> never right. put it off. Right. Pre-fight right. plans. Yeah, pre-fight plan. And the second thing is never call names. Never call names. Never play this game. And some of you play it, and if, you, if you're one of those people, please stop doing this, is where you say, I didn't say you were that. I said you were acting like that. Come on, you know who you, you know are. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't say you were dumb. I said you were acting dumb. You know what I mean? And those kind of games don't play. You just don't, you can't play those games. You're playing into the enemy's um, schemes to like put these labels on our spouses or on our friends or the people that we love the most. What we should do, and Jason does this so well. He's such a like, I, honestly, this is one of the things I admire about him the most, that even in the middle of conflict where opinions are varying, and he could say I'm acting like something, and he doesn't. What he starts to tell me is who I am, really. And he starts to tell me the things he really believes who I am. So in the middle of a conflict, he'll say something like, Veronica, I know you're a very sympathetic person. And I know that you really care about this situation. I know that you're very loving and tender to this. And it immediately changes the conflict from it being high emotion to us being on the same playing field and us being able to really conversate about something. It's not about saying, you're just acting very irrational or you're just being dumb or whatever it is that we say. But no, we are able to call out the right names in each other and not the wrong names. Never call names. Pre-fight rules. Here we go. Never raise your voice. Hey, everybody, I'm just telling you, you, you can say what you want to say, but you don't have to be loud. Right. You don't have to be rude about it. The, the Bible says a harsh word stirs up anger. You're not helping anybody, and you're not sounding more smart the more volume you have. You're not convincing anybody. You're, you're not helping. You're hurting. So say what you want to say, but keep it calm. Right. right. And then secondly here is, don't, or thirdly, is Fourthly. never get <laughs> historical. Never get hysterical, yes, that too, but not. don't get historical. Don't bring up all of the past. How many of you have ever heard the term gunny sacking? Anyone? Gunny sacking? It's a conflict term for when someone comes to the conflict with everything and anything that anyone has ever done. So you bring up all the past, all the issue in that moment, and it's just not cool. We don't do that. Here's the next one. Never say never or always. Okay? You always act. You never are no one is ever always or never anything. And whenever you do that, here's what happens. You start arguing about the validity of that statement. Uh-uh, I'm not always. I did this and I've done this instead of actually talking about what's really the problem. So here's a rule. Never say never or always in your fights. Right. And then the biggest one that we for sure keep on our list is never threaten divorce. Yeah. Never threaten separation or uh, threaten anything like use anything as leverage to threaten your spouse to get your way i would say and i say this with with conviction feeling like the lord really wanted me to say this today that if you are that person in the room and you feel like you are the one constantly threatening to leave constantly threatening to have that back door that your emotionally intelligence level is probably at that teenage stage and you should go back to that stage and really heal from whatever was happening in your teenage years and stop acting like that teenager again. And, and so that your family, your children, your children's children, huh. and your future and your home can be restored and have yeah. health because teenagers act that way. Teenagers go and say, I'm not going to get my way, so I'm going to do something else. I'm going to take my ball and run. I'm going to have a backdoor plan because that's what... Um, they do at that stage. And now the first decision was that we need to restore peace and I will act and not react. And then number two, write this down, is I will focus on the good things in you. I will focus on the good things. We are go we're going to separate the conflict from the person. We're going to gather the stones of who the person is, of, of my spouse. My spouse, he is so loving. 
And he's incredibly hardworking. And so when I go to prayer for him and my friends, my coworkers, I don't say, God, Jason is being such a jerk, and God help him. Lord, he is just getting on my nerves. He cannot ever fix anything. He's always this. He's always that. Um, whatever it is, I'm just making stuff up. None of it's real. And, um, you know, go to God that way. What I go to God is I say, God, thank you that he's a man of integrity. And I gather the stones in his life. And I gather and reposition my thoughts and my own heart posture before God and before, so my, for my own health to say, I'm going to believe and see the best in him. I think for a lot of you in the room, you might have lost that focus. You might have not remember, you can't even remember the good things in your spouse. And I would challenge you today to try to remember some of those. And, and Psalm, or Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. The, the main word there, whatever. Whatever you can find about your spouse that is good, especially in a moment of conflict. It, whatever. He took a shower t- that day, great. As you're like having a differing of opinion, you can think he took a shower today. The bar is really low, That's guys. Awesome. Come on now. Come on. That's all. No, but seriously, you're having a differing in opinion. You need to think of whatever you can think of that is good about them because it's really hard to steer that ship in the other direction and say, no, whatever. He did great today at bathing. He smells really awesome. <laughs> so if you want peace, change your focus. Because you can choose to continue. You can t- continue to clobber each other with those stones. You can continue to scatter them, scatter them, or you can gather them and build an altar and make some different choices. Let God do something inside of you. And at this altar between you and God, okay, God, I'm going to act and not react. I'm, I'm going to choose to not throw the stones and look at every negative thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on the good. Here's the third decision at the altar of God that I want you to make today, and that is this. I will apply God's grace to you. Because Because I want all the grace, God, but um, it's amazing to me how much grace we can receive and not give to other people. Because God forgive me, but punish them, God. Get them. Get them. Hurt them. Make them pay. Make them feel this, Lord. Romans chapter 12 says like this, do not take revenge. Now, it doesn't say if they're right or wrong. It doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Some of you are like, oh, I like that part. Burn him, God. Get him. That's not what it means right there, guys. Okay, when he's talking about here, the the burning there refers to remorse, meaning this, that your kindness to them is going to lead them to repentance. That's what that means. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, now, what we need to do is, is instead of throwing the stones, we're, we need to build an altar. What if we did this? Instead of clobbering each other, we built an altar. I promise you, you can do this. And for some of you, you're like, I don't know if I can. This sounds, you don't know where it's at. The reality is, if you're saying, like, I don't know if I can, the reality is you're right if you don't do this fourth one, okay? Because this fourth one I'm about to give you, every time you do it, like, if you don't do it, you don't have the power. But if you do this, and every time you do this, a new capacity comes inside of you. God, be, God transforms you more and gives you capacity to now do this for others. So the fourth decision at the altar of God that we're going to build together is this. I will remember God's grace to me. I'll remember how good God has been, how faithful he has been, how loving and kind he has been to me even when I don't deserve it. Because every time I remember what he's done for me, now I have the capacity to do it for others. Before you put your stuff away, let me read this verse for you. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 through 11 in the message paraphrase. Look what it says. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God. Time out right there. Listen to me. Some of you have been withholding love for a while. Like it's hard for you to love them right now because it hurts so bad. And, and, and you're just like bottled up. You got the stone in your, you've been hitting each other and hurting each other. And, and what you, you think that you're By withholding love that you're hurting them, but you're not. By withholding love, you're withholding God. You don't know the first thing, because God is love. So you can't know him if you don't love. 
this is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world so we might live through him. This is the kind of love we're talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us. and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sin and the damage we've done to our relationships with God. My dear, dear friends, he says, if God loved us like this, we certainly ought to love each other. When I remember the way that God has loved me, when I remember the grace of God that he has for me, when I'm not focused on their issues and their problem and this conflict and having these stones in my hand, but I'm building an altar with God and I remember the love of God in my life, the grace of God. There's a new capacity that you get. Some of you, this is what's preventing you from actually showing the love. It actually has nothing to do with love. Listen to me. It has, it has everything to do with God manifested in your life who is love. You withholding love has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with you not coming back to a place, the altar. Letting God show you who he is, love you, show his grace to you. Some of you need to remember. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.